Blog Talk Radio. Hello and welcome to Virtues of Peace. My name is Hope Elizabeth May. I am joined by Taylor Ackerman. Hello. Michael Buzzy. Hello, everyone. And Randy Olson. Uh, Hello, hello. (laughs) So we are back after a small hiatus um, and are also back to an issue that we first talked about back in August when um, we marked the 75th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima. And there's been some developments on that issue recently, this past weekend, uh, coinciding with another 75th anniversary. And um, actually, the events that happened this weekend were intentionally, uh, they were trying to do this um, to to match up with this anniversary date, which is the 75th anniversary of the entry into force of the UN Charter. And so uh, the timeline is, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki dropping the bombs in August, and then uh, in October, the UN Charter enters into force in 1945. So coinciding with the 75th anniversary uh, was the international campaign for the abolition of nuclear weapons, pushing to get the 50th ratification Um, which does trigger a new era in the conversation about the legality of nuclear weapons. So this is a sort of introduction show to that treaty, to some just basics about international law. It's a sort of 101 show. I don't know if we'll get through all of the issues in an hour, but our show resources page at virtuesofpeace.com has a number of different resources, including the text of the treaty itself in English. Um, you can, of course, access the text in other languages as well. Um, we will be focused on primarily on what's called the preamble, which is the sort of philosophical statement, the sort of spirit behind the treaty. Following the preamble, you get like the legal language about articles and so forth, but we're going to be focused on a few sentences in the preamble, so that's where we're going. Um, I just want to say a couple words about the title, so think we must, um, and this actually is a phrase used by Virginia Woolf uh, in one of her essays called Thoughts of Peace During an Air Raid. Um, she says, think we must there, and that I uh, we use this phrase because that really does connect with the themes of the shows that we did in August, um, stressing a revolution of thought, a new way of thinking, um, and, and basically people who have written about the nuclear issue stress this, we need to change our thinking. Um, and so I want to connect with that. Maybe it's not such a change, but um, on this podcast, we like to look to the past for um, for wisdom uh, and a lot of these voices that have been silenced, uh, such as Bertha von Suttner, who I may mention later on today. But one in particular, and you can access this on our show resources page for today's show, it's an essay that I have repeatedly mentioned, and that is a 1907 essay by Elihu Root, page one, volume one, issue one. You can, again, you can go to the show resources page and see the PDF yourself. Page one, issue one, volume one for the American Journal of International Law. What is the very first article titled, A Need of a Popular Understanding of International Law? That is 1907. And really, to start to wrap your mind around the nuclear issue and this treaty, you have to have a popular understanding of international law. So that's our goal for this show and perhaps the shows that will come uh, after it. Uh, So 
just a little bit about the history again about this treaty. Um, it began to be open for signature on September 20th, 2017. So first the UN had to agree to allow it to be open to signature, and that happened, I believe, in July 2017. And then I think it's significant that it's open for signature September 20th um, because that coincides with uh, the UN International Day of Peace, which was selected to coincide with the opening of the, the, the um, General Assembly session. So there's that connection. Um, there are more than 50 signatories of the treaty, so the treaty needs 50 ratifications to, quote, enter into force or take effect. What I think there's some like 84 signatories, so not all of the signatories have ratified, um, and that means do what is legislatively necessary to um, make their, their national commitment binding law. Um, so to begin the conversation, I'm going to play just this introductory clip. It's about a minute long, and it comes from a longer 25-minute discussion that you can access uh, on our show resources page that aired on Al Jazeera. It's an excellent discussion, um, and we're going to be playing several clips from, from that, that longer discussion. So this is the first, and that will begin our discussion. It's about a minute long. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. It's been hailed as a new chapter for nuclear disarmament, but opposed by the world's major powers. A UN treaty banning nuclear weapons has now been ratified by 50 countries and will come into force next January. But none of the countries that have approved it actually have a nuclear arsenal, and no country that has one has approved the treaty. All this raises doubts about how much it can achieve. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Gutierrez, has called ratification the culmination of a worldwide movement to draw attention to the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons. It represents a meaningful commitment towards the total elimination of nuclear weapons, which remains the highest disarmament priority of the United Nations. We'll bring in our guests in a moment, but first, some background. It's formally called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and the UN opened it up for signatures in 2017. Countries signing up promised to never develop test, produce, manufacture, otherwise acquire, possess, or stockpile nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices. That commitment is legally binding, but critics say there's no real way to enforce it. And as we mentioned, none of the world's acknowledged nuclear powers have signed it. In fact, the U.S. government has spent the last several years trying to get some countries to withdraw their signatures. Okay, so that's the clip, and again, you can watch the entire discussion on our show resources page at virtuesofpeace.com. So we're just going to go around, um, and, and I should say, if, if you're listening to this and you, you want to call in with a question or, or an antidote, please, uh, anecdote, not an <laughs> antidote, uh, please call in to 516-387-1449. Um, but Taylor, so reactions to that clip? Yeah, I think what really stood out to me is the fact that nuclear powers haven't signed on and the implications mm -hmm. of that. Um, mm -hmm. So while they would all recognize sort of the humanitarian law principles of distinction and, and different and, um, necessity, I think that the fact that they refuse to sign on indicates that they're maybe not willing, in fact, to um, mm. move towards uh, de-escalation of the nuclear, their nuclear arsenal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, and that, I, you know, we'll talk more about that later, but yeah, no, as I think he says, none of the signatories have nuclear arsenals, and no country which has a nuclear arsenal is a signatory. <laughs> so that one wonders, um, yeah, what, what that means in terms of international law and the abolition of nuclear weapons. I think yeah, it was the total elimination, and I'm going to come back to that quote by uh, Antonio Gutierrez, who's the Secretary General of the UN. Um, this you know, signals that the total elimination is the highest priority of the United Nations. So I plant that seed. Uh, Michael, reactions to the clip? Yeah, I... The international sort of diplomacy implications and that interaction really fascinated me. 
with that whole aspect. And to kind of go off what Taylor said, I think it was Beatrice Finn, who was, I believe, one of the instrumental members in ICANN that helped to facilitate this treaty. She mentions in the furthering discussion that it's interesting that none of the nuclear armed nations signed on to it and a lot of the nations that are closely allied with these mm-hmm. nuclear armed nations signed on to it. And so she was kind it was a really interesting point by her that these nations that are known for espousing peace, Japan, mm-hmm. South Korea, for example, are closely aligned with the United States and they did not sign on to this treaty. So kind of exposing that double standard there, I thought was very fascinating, especially given Japan's history with the whole nuclear issue and them not signing on. It was interesting that sort of this overarching geopolitical aspect kind of over overran that history and all NATO members except the Netherlands did not sign it. They abstained. They, mm-hmm. they just simply did not vote except the Netherlands who voted no for it. So, mm-hmm. and I mm-hmm. think when you look at another really interesting thing is when you look at the map of nations that did sign on the nations, the one I've been seeing is like nations in gray did not sign on. And then nations colored in blue did vote. Yes. 122 of them, by the way, most of them reside in the global South, which I think is fascinating as well. That you have this sort of geopolitical North South divide with, there are no nuclear armed powered nations in the, in the global South. So they would then have the most to lose from a nuclear exchange by the United States and Russia, the fallout, the utter collapse of human civilization and the economy, the radiation fallout would affect the North before it would affect the global South. So there's that dimension as well. Other interesting thing for me was, South, uh, South Africa and Kazakhstan both did vote yes on the treaty, and these were both formerly nuclear-armed nations who then gave them up, South Africa having developed them themselves, and then Kazakhstan having held nuclear weapons after the fall of the Soviet Union and then went through the process of the non-Lugar threat <laughs> cooperation effort to sort of then move the nuclear weapons away from them. So, yes, I absolutely ad- – Love, I find it so fascinating. I love this stuff. And so, yeah, all those very interesting connections between, like, the political mm-hmm. aspect of it I found very, very fascinating. Mm-hmm. Cool. And Randy? Well, uh, I'm a little, I guess, sort of disappointed that the, you know, nuclear weapon states can't even commit to... Uh, the ideal of disarmament because the treaty it's like it it doesn't unpack exactly how and when and where it's like we're going to try and we're going to talk about more like about what the actual treaty requires and we're going to get into it but all things considered it's it's really disappointing that we we're, we're we've been talking about the obvious insanity of like mutual self-destruction through a nuclear war for like 70 years and we're still not all on the same page and I just don't understand like this it's it seems okay it seems like a supreme act of vanity to to try to hold the position that like my country's sovereignty is more valuable than the entire human right, uh, the entire human race. Like mm-hmm. somehow we can't get over that bridge and it's disappointing. So, I mean, mm-hmm. and we'll go into it more, but that's my initial reaction. Yeah. From what I understand, I mean, this treaty, uh, the United States um, and other other allies of the United States. The United States is not the only country that's been been critical of this treaty. Uh, Philosophically, is more attached to the non-proliferation treaty, and they see that as like, that's what we should be focused on. We don't need another treaty. We have this architecture, the non-proliferation treaty, and let's not complicate things and introduce this other thing. Um, And I think that I I, I totally understand the the movement that arose because, as we have discussed on this show, the Nonproliferation Treaty is not being complied with. I mean, there's an article in there. uh, I think it's Article 6, 
that requires nuclear weapon states to dismantle their arsenals. And as we have discussed on this show, the Marshall Islands took their complaint to the International Court of Justice only the United Kingdom really seemed to entertain the argument. So this is the other thing. When Antonio Guterres says, this shows, you know, we are totally committed to the elimination of nuclear weapons and it's the highest priority. Well, the court of the UN, the International Court of Justice, uh, dismissed on technical grounds. There were dissenting judges, to be sure, but the court dismissed on technical grounds the Marshall Islands complaint. And again, all they're asking to do in that case is to have the International Court of Justice put, I don't know, some kind of pressure on the nuclear weapon states to keep their legal obligations and denuclearize. And so that's sort of like an aha moment when that happens with the International Court of Justice. Uh, a lot of people are just totally unaware of that, I think. And so that's why we you know, talked about it on some of our shows. But um, uh, in terms of just like, and I know, you know, Antonio Gutierrez is a, you know, um, different secretary general, um, but I just wonder about the rhetoric as well from 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 the UN and and we also have to sort of look at at its court and 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 that requires looking at the judges on the court so it's not just the court we have to penetrate the uh or as the we say in is said in business law pierce the corporate veil but in this sense it's called pierce the bureaucratic veil of the UN and the International Court of Justice and reach the actual like states that are sort of behind the scenes, if you will, and, and the judges that are on the court. Um, and so, again, if you're listening and you have a question, you can call in at 516-387-1449. Um, we'll play more clips from that very useful Al Jazeera discussion, but we want to go into the preamble of the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, also called the TPNW. And so, Taylor, you had a specific provision that, that, you, would, that you wanted to discuss. Can you read that and then um, sort of say why it impacted you? Yes. Yeah, so it says uh, one of the provisions say, considering that any use of nuclear weapons would be contrary to the rules of international law applicable in armed conflict, in particular, the principles and rules of international humanitarian law. So for me, one of the most disappointing ICJ cases, in addition to the Marshall Islands case, um, was the, the advisory opinion on legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons, which the court um, rendered in 1996. Um, and although it recognized that there, there were these principles um, in international humanitarian law, which I mentioned earlier, of proportionality, which means that this, which we've discussed previously in the show, means that the um, response has to be proportional of an armed, uh, an armed attack. Uh, the principle of military necessity, which means that it has to be necessary. You can't cause unnecessary suffering. And the principle of distinction, which is the, the states um, and armed groups must distinguish between civilians and combatants. You can't just you know, put out a weapon and you're not sure, um, you're not even trying to avoid civilians. So um, the court basically said that while it, it had a hard time seeing the situations where nuclear weapons would be lawful under these principles, they couldn't decide if it was lawful or not um, in, quote, an extreme circumstance of self-defense in, the very survival, in which the very survival of a state would be at stake. And I feel like this, this preamble clause really kind of rebukes that idea by saying that it, it's contrary to the rules of international law, you know, period. Um, because I think to most people, uh, it's very clear that nuclear weapons cannot be proportional um, or to any other form of armed attack, but more importantly, that it, it can't be, it cannot distinguish between civilians and combatants. And quite frankly, it runs against every principle of humanity and decency and human dignity that we've sort of tried to establish in our international humanitarian law system. So I think that the states in this situation were really trying to rebuke that sort of exceptional carve-out 
um, that mm. exists in the advisory opinion. Cool. And just for our listeners, you use the you use the abbreviation ICJ. Um, and if you're not aware of what that means, that means, you know, International Court of Justice. That is the court of the UN. It's located in The Hague, in the Peace Palace. Um, and the Peace Palace was there long before the ICJ was there. So, cool. Um, I have some comments to that, but let's, uh, Michael. Do you want my section of the preamble? Please. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, the section that really caught my attention and had a deep impact on me was mindful of the unacceptable suffering of and harm caused to the victims of the use of nuclear weapons. And then in parentheses, it has hibaksha, which is a Japanese term for individuals who survived nuclear bombing at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then it continues as well as those affected by the testing of nuclear weapons. And I, this one for me was twofold. In that it really, so first mindfulness, I saw this as very individualistic to all people around the world, that you have to hold within yourself a great deal of empathy and compassion for those who have greatly suffered at the hands of nuclear weapons, those who survived the attack on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945. And then in the other section of the preamble, when it says those affected by testings, I'm immediately my mind immediately goes to the people of the Marshall Islands and elsewhere who are still to this day dealing with the fallout and radiation effects of the, of the tests that happened by, conducted by the United States in the 1950s and so on. And so a quote that came to me as well from Thomas Nagel's The Possibility of Altruism says, you are one person among others equally real, which I thought also tied well into the mindfulness aspect is that this, regardless of, you know, national, international sort of organizations that you as an individual must be able to feel empathy and recognize the absolute horror and destruction caused by these weapons and want to completely within the fiber of your being never want another individual to experience the horrors of these weapons again. And I think that's why going, seeking the knowledge of the Hibaksha and individuals who survived these testing and testings and their life experience is so crucial. They also, they have a very unique and profound insight into resilience and perseverance and the effect of these weapons on individuals. And I feel, I find that very applicable as people sort of start to grapple with this. And I, I really like the quote that you said towards the beginning of the show hope that, and there is a need for popular understanding of international law because when I've discussed this treaty with individuals who are older than me, than even within my peer group, there's sort of this basic understanding that, you know, nuclear weapons are bad. And if we were to be affected by them, that would immediate, that would be an absolute travesty. But then there's this immediate sort of, I would say political reaction that comes next. And they will say, well, Michael, we as the United States cannot simply give up our weapons because in in nations like Russia, North Korea, and China will then have them. And then what does that mean? And so then that's sort of where their mind immediately falls back to. So it's all about this furthering of education, being mindful, recognizing that there's this sort of overarching, seriously, seriously adverse issue that exists and that regardless of these sort of political inclinations that most individuals hold when they think about this nuclear issue, that it is a human, it is an overarching humanitarian one. And that's what, and that was sort of the greater implications for me and an interesting insight from talking to individuals and further encouraged me to, you know, educate people on this issue so they can then get to that mindset and understanding. Thanks. Randy. Um, well, first, I'd like to briefly comment on what Michael brought up because it triggered something cool for me, okay. um, and mm-hmm. then I'll and then I'll transition. Cool. Um, I, I, you know, this this word mindfulness with uh, in the context of nuclear weapons is is reminded me that you know there's a there's a, there's an appropriate psychological reaction to the fact that we have developed technology that can annihilate all of the human <laughs> like progression that has taken place. 
there, there's like a non-trivial component to that. And there's a, like initially fear is probably the appropriate response, which I mean, I'm sure occurred during the cold war, but you know, now there's like this, this air of seriousness to like, wait a minute, like we really need to take this and think about it. And, um, and so like the nuclear issue kind of forces that into our consciousness because it's so enormous. So anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. Mm-hmm. So on that note, um, one of the other things in the preamble, uh, it says, Emphasize, emphasizing that nothing in this treaty shall be interpreted as affecting the inalienable rights of its state parties to develop, research, production, and use of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes without discrimination. In other words, nuclear weapons are a technology. They come as a production of learning a tremendous amount about energy and the manipulation of energy. And so the United Nations has a organized unit which is responsible for monitoring the progression of that technology around the world. And different, like different departments of different countries are going to be doing different kinds of research. And when it comes to anything that has to do with nuclear energy and nuclear power, there's an organization called the International Atomic Energy Association, the IAEA. And what they do is basically go around and they're the people who are doing the, the the tours or the, you know, like when nuclear weapon states have to get an inspection, right? It's one of these people. They show up and they look around and they're like, yep, everything seems like it's going according to plan. And uh, I just, I'm, I guess the word is flabbergasted by how amazing we I guess take for granted how these working parts, these moving pieces can all slide into place so that, yeah, you can actually pursue technology that is absolutely catastrophic. You know, the enrichment of uranium is one form of technology that has catastrophic implications, but it's like, that's not the only thing you can do with the technology. And we're going to make sure that there's a whole body of people who make sure that the research is going in the right directions and what it's being used for has, you know, everybody's best interests in mind. And of course there's an idealism packaged into that, but in any case, there are people thinking about this and then there are institutions in place that have, organizations that do the actual inspections that make sure everything is going according to plan. And, you know, that's just the general skeleton for how all that happens and how that works. Um, Last piece about that, right? So the same organization has partners, sister organizations that are responsible for like licensing and, um, like get, giving the little stamp of approval on the actual like software for the computer programs that do things inside of the hardware, which that becomes a very useful thing to know because, okay, we have all these devices that are monitoring things in all, like all over the world. And somebody has to be able to look at those screens and figure out what those things mean in order to report things to other people for these committees. Right? So there's these, these big, there's these big conversations happening all because of technology and learning to distill that technology into meaningful conversations and measure progress is all happening. And the IAEA is one example of an organization doing that work, which is part of this bigger picture of nuclear uh, proliferation and the disarmament of that proliferate uh, nuclear arsenal, all of that. Yeah, thanks for that. And we played, you know, when, when you go back to the, the shows that we did uh, back in August of this year, uh, we briefly mentioned and also played a clip from President 
Eisenhower's Adams for Peace speech. Uh, and if memory serves, that, that, that speech laid the foundation for the IAEA. And, and to this day, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, yeah, their, their motto is Adams for Peace. Um, and so that's a kind of revolution of thought, right, that we have this technology, but let's not, yeah, let's pursue what we need to do to make sure that this technology, powerful as it is, is used for peaceful purposes for the uplift of humanity. Um, I, I, Before reading my the sentence that I chose from the preamble, I just want to open it up to um, – First, Taylor, and then Michael, if you have any yeah, comments in light of anything that was has been said thus far. So, Taylor, first. If not, they can just say no. If, if yes, go ahead. Well, I think what's interesting is um, when we go back to this idea of education and international law that you mm-hmm. brought up the, at the beginning, um, like, even though I've taken a lot of international law classes, I never really thought about the technology exchange and um, the importance of sort of this technology exchange that Randy brought up. I think it brings to the forefront that um, a lot of issues in the treaties um, are best understood through a variety of lenses. Mm -hmm. Um, And especially with nuclear weapons, how there's this inter-exchange between the technological necessity and the needs of, you know, humanitarian protection um, and, I, I think that's very important to keep in mind when looking at treaties, that there's more mm. uh, more considerations in the creation of an international treaty and international obligations within the international community than than maybe someone sees at the at the on the, in the text, you know, as a purely textualist mm-hmm. uh, reading. Mm-hmm. But there's a reason behind every every provision. Yeah, cool. Um, Michael. Yeah, I. For me, it was twofold. I completely echo the sentiments of Taylor that this, this education in international law is paramount. It was something, I'll admit, I was mostly ignorant of for the majority of my lifetime until just recently. And that involves a great deal of work on myself, but then also seeking out individuals who are here to enlighten me, which I consider the three of you to be amongst them. So I'm very fortunate of that. And I thought Randy's point about the technology was also very profound that in a way nuclear technology is at the forefront of our cutting technology our sort of cutting edge technology currently and it is being used to power our next wave of rovers to mars and it'll be the thing that helps us to you know further our development of the world and you know expanding our human civilization out into the stars and sort of education with that component to realize that these weapons that weapons, in a sense, are not needed with this technology, and then sort of changing the view on that, like Taylor said, seeing it through many different lenses, and then spinning that in a way to see the technology as an advancement mechanism in a posit- that is used in a positive way instead of in a very destructive human race annihilating way, but to be used in a positive way that that would continue to further the betterment of the whole of humanity. I found that to be very interesting. Mm-hmm. Thanks. And, um, yeah, I have, like, many, many thoughts that I'll try to to bring together in, in one thread. But um, one of the shows that we did back in August, uh, we, we spent some time looking at the Russell Einstein Manifesto. <clears throat> That's 1955. Um, and that, you know, sort of, again, is this, it's a shift in thinking about the responsibility of scientists and people who are making this technology. So I want to, yeah, sort of connect this discussion back to that earlier moment in 1955. I want to connect it to Pugwash, um, which and the Pugwash conferences, because that that uh, manifesto calls for yeah conferences to happen. <laughs> and dialogue to happen amongst scientists where they start to talk about their duties as scientists to humanity. And the Einstein Manifesto also calls for the peaceful resolution of disputes, which we see, of course, called for earlier. Um, the, the, The sentence that I picked up out from the preamble also relates to this issue of technology, and it says, cognizant that the catastrophic consequences of nuclear weapons 
have a disproportionate impact on women and girls, including as a result of ionizing radiation. Um, I did not know until I read that sentence in the preamble that that was the case. And on our Shore Resources page, there is a website on the Gender and Radiation Impact Project. And so, again, this is another dimension of technology on how ionizing radiation actually disproportionately harms women and that the risk of cancer coming from ionizing radi radiation is increased for women, is higher for women than it is for men. So there's a website on that, genderandradiation.org. It's on our show resources page. Check out that project. Um, and lastly, we have a caller, and I'll get to the call in a moment. So I just wanted to make um, one more point um, about uh, Taylor's um, sentence from the preamble which stressed, you know, contrary to the rules of, of international law and in particular the rules of international humanitarian law. And Taylor, in your, your gloss on that sentence, you know, you talked about the rules of humanitarian law and um, how these weapons so obviously seem to violate the principles of humanitarian law like proportionality, discrimination, necessity, et cetera. And thinking about this, you know, like sort of beneath all of that is a provision of military law and humanitarian law, um, which I've, I've drawn attention to in our shows that they, we did with uh, Charlie Hanley on the No Gun Re Massacre, and just the permissibility of what's called collateral damage. Um, I find contrary to the principles of humanitarian law, to ideals of like dignity and um, these these things that we we claim to stand for. And I think that if we do really care about you know one innocent life and so forth, that we really need to rethink um, the legality of collateral damage. I think that um, like because yeah, you you can't target you can't target civilians intentionally. That's a no no. But um, if the goal, I've said this before in our earlier shows, if the goal is worthy enough, and what would that be like? I don't know. We destroy a, a, a thousand nuclear warheads somewhere. Um, and yes, we'll have to use a nuclear warhead to do it. And yes, uh, but, you know, the proportional gain outweighs the, you know, the loss of life, the collateral damage. And I just, I just have a problem with that way of thinking. And I think that, you know, I don't know how to how to think about it totally, but I think that when we're talking about a revolution of thought and a new way of thinking, it has to include um, another look at collateral damage. Uh, I'm going to take a call here. So, caller, are you there? Oh, yes, I'm here. Hello. Hi. Um, uh, who are you and, and uh, where are you calling from? Um, my name is Michelle Powers. I'm a student here at CMU. Um, I'm calling from the warmth of my bedroom because it's cold outside today. <laughs> um, cool. Did you have a question or comment? Um, I did have kind of like a question. Um, mm -hmm. So first of all, I appreciate, I like that this is kind of like a 101 podcast, cause, or like mm -hmm. this episode, because I definitely don't know much about um, all this. So I appreciate that you're kind of like breaking it down and doing it simply so that people like me can understand. Um, but I was just kind of wondering, like, what other kinds of things and, like, issues and stuff are wrapped up? I guess this kind of goes back to a little bit we were talking about, or I guess what you guys were talking about earlier, um, but, like, wrapped up in the importance of keeping the nuclear weapons because it seems, if I understood correctly, it seems like even the language that they've been using in, like, the preamble and just, like, in general, like, in a lot of the um, um, declarations and things that you have been mentioning it, and they, it seems that they really realize that they can't get a hold on, like, um, the damage that it does and that there's really no way of, like, not targeting – or like, even if they're mm. not, like, targeting civilians, like, there's no way to be able to rein it back and, like, not have that happen. Um, so I, I guess I'm just a little confused why – I mean, I know it's not as easy as just, like, everyone saying we're not going to do it anymore, but I was just I, – I guess what other kinds of things is really stopping them – and doing that besides just like not not wanting to be the first one to take that step, if that makes sense. 
so I'll, I'll, I'll take it first uh, and just say <clears throat> I think that um, – and, and one of the clips that we play um, uh, sort of indirectly refers to this, but there's um, a dominant philosophy um, of, of deterrence that actually – like you need these weapons – like the the possession of these weapons actually implies they're not going to be used. <laughs> and so if we, you know, start to get rid of them, like not everybody's going to do that. And so we have to be like, we're facing a world where like they're here, they're here to stay and eliminating them is, or at least through this through this instrument, um, this is something we talked about in the beginning. Like this is not the way to do it, and um, I think you know, I think people do realize they're bad. They just disagree about the the way by by which you get rid of them, um, and one of the sort of obstacles is this dominant philosophy of deterrence which is is the philosophy of nato um so when you you have to change your thinking there so that that's that's my answer i don't know if anybody else wants to add like why why like why are we not doing like why is this taking so long to yeah get rid of uh i can i can paint the picture um you know if we imagine if we imagine a, a visual like uh like imagine a bank robbery right somebody runs in and they have a weapon and they're trying to get something which the you know the whole age of imperialism it's like there were, we were trying to get stuff people were going all over trying to get stuff and sure enough somebody ran into the bank with a grenade and you know, everybody's on edge, like, okay, we definitely don't want that thing to go off. But now we're in a world where, like, seven people in the bank all have their hands on the pin. And they're all just looking at each other. And the first person to put it down, on, on, on the one hand, like, the first person who puts that grenade down, like, they're definitely doing the right thing. But they also take, they, le- they lose all of their leverage. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, there's a motive behind it. It's an old, ancient, power-based need to have a say in the conversation. And if you don't have a say in the conversation, the people whose hands are on the grenade simply push you out of the circle. So, I mean, that's at least the fear. That's the motive, right? That That's the underlying, well, I don't want to not be able to contribute into the conversation. There's something close to that anyway. It's much more complicated, but that's the, that's enough mm-hmm. to get, you know, the frame there. Mm-hmm. Cool. Mm-hmm. Anybody else want to chime in? Yeah, I would definitely agree with both what you have said, Hope, and what Randy have said, that this is very, in a way, it's very primordial, going off of what Randy said, going off what you said, Hope, is also it's very political. I think another reason for it is is that once you have something, it's very, very difficult to give it up, especially when you factor in all those other things that we have discussed, you know, this whole nature that if we were to be the first ones to give them up completely, then our adversary, our quote unquote adversaries on the global stage would still have them. And then, you know, that would put us at a dis, quote unquote disadvantage globally than if they were wanting to, you know, annihilate us off the face of the earth. I definitely think great grave misunderstandings and mistrust that are deep seated between the United States, Russia, China, North Korea especially, that is still something that is a major hurdle in the way. But I think in a positive a positive light, one of the greatest nuggets I have found through my whole exploration of this issue was the, was the Nunn-Lugar Threat Cooperative Initiative that occurred in the late 90s in the Bill Clinton administration under, led by the Secretary of Defense at the time, William J. Perry. And it was this whole process where, okay, so the Soviet Union has collapsed and all of these Soviet satellite states that are now newfound nations have an immense amount of nuclear weapons. Once the Soviet Union collapsed, Kazakhstan and Ukraine both found themselves within the top 10 countries of the world with the largest nuclear arsenal. It was a huge deal. And so then their whole initiative was through mutual understanding, cooperation, 
that laborious work of building relationships, they were able to get these nations to completely denuclearize and dismantle their weapons facilities. And by giving them the things that mattered, economic support, understanding, credibility on the world stage, so you weren't instilling within them that they have something that is essential to their survival. And I think that sort of adverse, that deep-seated primordial reaction that this is, if we were to completely give these up, then, you know, our survival is completely at stake. I think that's a big factor as well. But it has been done, so that gives me hope that one day through this initiative and through the countless hours of work by amazing individuals all across the world that we will one day hopefully reach a stage where we will no longer be a nuclearized, in a sense, weaponized world in that way. Mm. Cool. Taylor, do you have anything? Yeah, I think we've covered sort of the areas of the arguments for, you know, deterrence and sort of game theory type arguments. Um, And really the root of it is a lack of trust. And I think um, viewing each other as human, and it sort of highlights the problems of um, extreme patriotism and nationalism um, at the risk of uh, humanity. Like, you're so Mm -hmm. afraid of your country being harmed that you're willing to destroy the entire world or have the risk of it by it existing. Because the mere existence of the nuclear weapon, the problem with, you know, even if you don't use it, is it's ready to use and that any sort of political upheaval could cause um, a nuclear war. Um, because if one nuclear missile goes off, you've seen it in so many science fiction movies, that's kind of, you know, rid- seems ridiculous. But I remember years ago going to this event and they were speaking about how all these different occurrences were um, nuclear security was at risk. Um, and this includes nuclear power plants for sure, but um, it's quite frightening the idea that, um, you know, it exists, so it's, it's a temptation for, um, you know, terrorist hackers, but also for politicians. Um, and, I mean, I don't want to get too political in the U.S., but, you know, you never know. A country might seem like it's, you know, politically secure, but um, when you look at, you know, what's happened across the world, um, you know, there are authoritarian and more um, uh, attack, attack-minded attack um, individuals who might be more at risky, more at risk of um, using nuclear weapons. So that I just wanted to throw in a reason for um, getting rid of them entirely, even though there's this fear of deterrence or lack yeah. of deterrence. Cool. And uh, I think I mentioned this movie back on our, our August shows, and it, I think it's in 1983, a movie called War Games with Matthew Broderick, which is like a sort of classic, uh, like accidental um, nuclear war. So in addition to like the erratic, intentional yeah, behavior that we may see uh, taken by leaders, there's also this like, yeah, these systems are in place where Someone, there's there's like a mistake, and this mistake could lead to yeah, <laughs> accidentally uh, yeah World War Three. So there's that that aspect as well. It's just like this very dangerous, very very precarious situation that that we we find ourselves in. Um, so Michelle, I don't know if we're if we've answered your question. Do you have any you know sort of follow up questions or anything else? No, oh, that was great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you for. You're welcome to, you know, stay online or um, or hang up if, if that's easier for you. But uh, we're going to continue with the outline, and we really appreciate you calling in. Of course. Okay. So um, I'm going to play another clip from this Al Jazeera 25 minute long. Uh, discussion that uh, we began with. And this is a clip from Beatrice Finn. I think it was um, Michael, you mentioned her. She's sort of like, yeah, the the leader of the international campaign for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Um, So it's about a two-minute clip, and this will get us into a different dialogue. Beatrice, all the countries that have ratified the treaty are bound by its requirements. How is it going to be enforced? Well, I mean, international law is like, that. you know, it, it doesn't work. There's no world police that can come and put you in prison if you violate it. But, and that, that gives international law sometimes an unfair reputation of not being meaningful. But we do see that these kind of treaties 
do constrain governments, they do shift behaviors, and they work. Uh, not flawlessly, of course, no law works flawlessly, but they do work. And we see that based on the conventions that have banned other weapons, like the bioweapons conventions, like the chemical weapons, land mines, trust And for many of those, it has even impacted countries that not joined the treaty or didn't participate in the negotiations. We've seen, for example, the US, China, Russia shift their behavior when it comes to landmines. They did not join those, that treaty. We've seen them shift behavior when it comes to cluster bombs. They have not joined that treaty either. So I think we can see that this treaty, whether or not these countries will join, and we do think that eventually more countries, nuclear are, uh, allied states, states with US nuclear weapons on the territory, and eventually nuclear armed states will join this treaty. But in the meantime, it will also hopefully shift their behavior, uh, lead to more pressure on reduction, like uh, new START treaties, the CTBT coming into force, um, and other steps. Um, and I think we'd also give you know, much more political pressure on these countries. It took China and France almost 20 years to sign up to the treaty um, stopping proliferation of nuclear weapons, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And we believe that they will go faster with this one. Hmm. So that was Beatrice Finn um, from this longer, longer clip on our show resources page at virtuesofpeace.com. So... Um, Taylor, any reactions to that clip? I have so many, um, but I'll narrow it to a few. Um, so I think there's so much criticism of international law in the area of enforcement and questions of how to enforce. And I don't, I don't think people um, understand how powerful actually the political enforcement can be. And while there are mm. certainly times where it doesn't occur, those are more often um, exceptions. Um, by setting norms, um, naturally, um, people and, or entities in society are going to follow through with those norms because of, you know, social pressures and internal normal, normalization domestically um, and pressure from um, being called out if they violate it. Um, it's like, you know, you might not get in trouble from your friends if you, um, like, in terms of people might not, you know, give you ramifications if you're late, but if you're ashamed for being late, you're not going to be late as much. I mean, that seems very minor in comparison, but I think it's sort of the same principle mm. of just being able to call out a country for misbehaving and not following through with their commitments is mm. a powerful tool. And being able to have this piece of paper and say, you look, you, this, this is, you know, what you committed to, um, has ramifications for the country geopolitically on the international stage for its reputation, but also for its reputation internally. Um, people don't like to hear that their politicians are violating international norms and human rights and humanitarian law. Um, so I, I think that the political accountability is really important for enforcement. Cool. Michael? Yeah, when I was discussing this treaty with my peers and other individuals, after their knee-jerk political reactions, you sort of enlighten them as to what this means. And then, just like Beatrice had said, or the commentator had said to her, you know, what's the enforcement mechanism? They naturally asked that as well. They're like, well, if there's, like, no global police that are going to throw you in prison for violating this, then what's the point of even, you know, signing up to one of these treaties? But I think Taylor spelled it out perfectly, that it is this whole – norm setting that is so essential and internationally and domestically within nations as well and it's sort of is that it's very interesting how you can distill this down this social interaction down to even elementary school playgrounds that if you know all of your all of the individuals in your peer group are following one norm and you're not that's going to make you an outsider and ostracized and it's knee-jerk human nature to not want to feel that way and so and a large a decent amount of nations have signed this, 84 so far, 50 ratifications, and even in that Al Jazeera clip, Beatrice said, we're not stopping here, we plan on getting more and more to ratify this and sign on to it, which is huge, and I think as that expands to hopefully all 122 who voted in favor for it, that that'll put immense pressure on on these nuclear states, including the United States, who have not signed up to it, and then that can sort of serve as the beginning catalyst to influence their behavior in a positive track in a positive direction and get them to discuss with each other and start to abide by these international agreements. Cool. Thank you. Randy. Well, 
I appreciate the conversation about enforcement because it drives towards the the key issue for me. Um, and you know whether or not there's actually you know like a big UN police force that can enforce something to happen isn't really the issue. Um, as far as I can tell, the the enforcement does in fact, as Taylor brought up, come from like a internal pressure uh, built around something very specific. And and so in order to do that, I have to build a structure. So one of the things it's really useful to remember is that they're like all nuclear weapons are not hydrogen bombs, right? There's a lot of different nuclear weapons and when a treaty that's trying to eliminate nuclear weapons is around, what it's really doing is trying to create an attitude that abolishes the conflict completely. Because, you, you know, if, if, there's, if there's nuclear landmines and nuclear torpedoes and nuclear, like, land-to-air missiles, like, because all those exist, if those are not on the table, and those are the main kinds of weapons that everybody's equipped with, then war stops being a reasonable strategy. And I think that the long-term goal is packaged into the nuclear conversation. And that, to me, is where enforcement meets uh, idealism in a useful way. So I'm not sure if that's coherent, but, like... The, the the idea is we're not always just talking about getting people to dismantle the, you know, two gigaton bombs. Like, those aren't the key issue mm-hmm. all of the time. So, yeah, there are some... yeah, no, that's all. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, and uh, I, I also want to say that um, I don't. <clears throat> they're called dirty bombs, which are not, you know, nuclear weapons proper, but they do release radiation. Um, and so there, there are those weapons as well. Um, <clears throat> cool. I mean, I, I have many things to say in response. Um, anybody want to? Yeah comment on Randy's comment. Yeah, hope I had a quick I had a quick inter- thing that I just wanted to interject that yeah. interest Finn brought up in the Out to Zero talk that I thought was also really mm-hmm. profound. And you know, we we're talking about this norm setting and stuff. And a really I thought insightful point that she made was that regimes of nations change. So, you know, the current Trump administration one day, whether it's on January 20th of 2021 or in 2024, like that regime will change and a new Mm. administration will come in. Same like Vladimir Putin will not be in Russia forever. Xi Jinping will not be in Beijing and China forever. And so she was mentioning it in the context of Germany that the, they have a big national election coming up as well. And that many of the individuals running are for this treaty on the prohibition Mm. of nuclear weapons. And so that whole norm setting at a domestic and international level will impact those who will one day be running the nations who have not signed out onto it yet. And when they eventually are able to be in a position of power, they will then already have that mindset and I'll move their nation forward to sign up for those international agreements. So I thought that was a really important thing to keep in mind that it's very easy to see, you know, our current political situation internationally and domestically is stagnant, but it is fluid and it will one day change in that direction and that norm setting part now is a really important component of that. Yeah, cool. So um, um, norms, of course, have to be transmitted and then remembered. And, um, you know, I just go back, as I always do, to the 1899 Hague Peace Conference, which, which it's like that court, which still exists, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, you know, the, the treaty that sets that court up has a provision, I think it's Article 26, that says um, if you see that two states are about to yeah, go to war, then the signatories need to remind them that this court exists, that there's like this other process 
And uh, I just, I, I worry like, yes, because there is this fluidity, there's also a risk that these norms are not transmitted, they're not remembered. And I think that I, I predict that what we will see, like, first of all, a lot of people aren't even aware that this treaty happened. I, I asked my students, um, uh, no, they had, they had not heard. This did not come across their feeds and so forth. Um, and I think what may happen is just like a lot of silencing about this, number one. And number two, there's going to be an arg the argument made that the nonproliferation treaty is like the way to go. Um, and the other thing is there's, all, there's these structural problems. Apart from the, the fact that the people may change, there are structures in place that need to be changed. So I mentioned, you know, the whole, the, the norm accepting collateral damage is one. Another one is that in the United States, um, the president has, no matter who the president is, has the, the sole authority. Like there is no deliberative process that, that goes on between the president and the military. The president, him or herself, makes the decision alone whether to use nuclear weapons and there have been you know calls to change that structural piece so i think memory and structure are, are things that we have to reckon with um and uh and of course we've mentioned this on on our show as well you know promise keeping uh doing what you say you're going to do is extremely important so connected to all this is our last clip that <clears throat> we will play from the brilliant Shahil Shah, um, and he's also another contributor in the discussion at the Al Jazeera uh, show that we've been uh, pulling clips from, and so this is also about two minutes. Sahil, is disarmament actually possible now, or is this treaty just the 21st century version of the kellogg Briand Pact? Pact? That was signed in 1928. Its signatories promised not to use war to resolve disputes or conflict that certainly didn't prevent World War II from happening. Well, I think all of us would like to think that global disarmament is possible given the immense risks attached to nuclear weapons, but the main nuclear weapon states in the world today believe that the environment is not conducive for nuclear disarmament to occur. This is their main uh, argument that they use. But the TPNW will inevitably change discourse on nuclear weapons, and it'll change how we think about them, how we speak about them, as well as who thinks and speaks about um, nuclear weapons. And, um, you know, the countries that reject it, they have vested interests in the military status quo. Um, they have interests in being able to, to project power and benefit financially. And at the end of the day, uh, the idea that maintaining stability um, and nuclear weapons go hand in hand is just based off of sophisticated political, academic, and military theories. And even though some countries have turned them into doctrines, at the end of the day, they are just theories. And the TPNW flips those theories on their heads, and it memorializes all those that were affected by the production, testing, and use of nuclear weapons. And it calls everybody to be accountable for what they've done to the planet and to those populations and continue to put us all at risk. Hmm. So well said. So Taylor, reactions to that? I'm oh, sorry. Um, I had a tech problem for a minute. Um, so I want to discuss the constructivism um, in IR. So one of the... Um, hmm. One of the international relations theories is that um, our norms are socially constructed. Um, and mm -hmm. so one of the things that stood out to me um, about this idea of, you know, the environment changing um, would be that the, um, sorry, the environment is basically set socially um, by other states. Um, and so, I mean, I guess people could argue that there are other theories of IR, but I really think in terms of understanding sort of the nuclear that nuclear uh, nuclear environment, I guess people might call it say, we have to look at it from a, a multi-layered perspective of fluidity. So while we are talking about norm setting, um, we're changing the norms, and as we change our social environment, states are bound to change their behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay, so constructivism. Um, and 
I, I as you, you all know, I, uh, in addition to this fluidity, there also seems to be, um, you know, something that persists through these fluid changes, um, and that is, you know, what, what, what do we call it, like the humanitarian impulse or norms that are being created to reduce suffering, um, this kind of thing. So I, I see that as like, um, um, and like to complement the fluidity is also this project that persists through time um, around which international relations yeah, have been organized um, where that's coming from, you know, that's also subject to philosophical debate, whether it's like natural law or reason or just coming from society, what have you. That's a conversation for another day. Um, but, uh, okay, uh, Michael? Yeah, I agree with what you had, you had said, Hope. I thought Shahil Shah's comments were very well said, and his whole rhetoric of, you know, this current treaty flips the theories of mm. our the past throughout the entire second half of the 20th century of you know our way to protect ourselves internationally is through mutually assured destruction and all of this and our current understanding of you know what it means to be secure internationally like this flips it all on their head and completely changes hopefully the discourse of how we will go about thinking this. I thought that was very reminiscent to Shinzo Hamai's peace declaration mm. in Hiroshima on, in 1947. His whole declaration of this process requires us to have a revolution of thought. I thought the some sentiment was very similarly echoed in the Russell Einstein Manifesto, that this has to change the way in which we think about warfare. And that, yeah, this should hopefully, it seems to me to be just a further reiterating of this point that has been continuously said since the uh, droppings of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki that it truly requires us to utterly change the way in which we have thought of things for a very long time. And even this even applies to our national leaders as well. Hope you're talking about the whole doctrine of presidential sole authority, which came about under Harry Truman as this sort of that is the president and the president alone that has the sole authorization to use nuclear weapons his whole creation of that is an interesting story where the generals were sort of pushing as nuclear weapons to be used again. And then after he sort of came to terms with the truly horrific, the truly horrific realities of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that they were not military targets, that they were mainly civilian cities and many, many innocent, innocent individuals died that, you know, he thought it best to secure it under himself. But now that we have sort of, and that was in 1945. So, Look how far we've this whole revolution of thought is still occurring 75 years later, where that is in itself a doctrine and a theory that needs to be changed. And even it's interesting, I have been making my way through the Perry Foundation's brilliant podcast called At the Brink, which I would highly recommend anyone to listen to. It's absolutely phenomenal. They had Bill Clinton, former President Bill Clinton, on there, and they were questioning him about. How would you feel about changing the doctrine of presidential sole authority? And while he expressed sentiments that he was open to the idea of changing it, he was still hesitant as to getting rid of it. So still, we mm -hmm. have to further try to bake these norms into the next generation. It's something that needs to be continuously reiterated. And it's going to take a long time. It is mm -hmm. a hard process. I mean, look, we only reached this point currently with the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons 75 years after the initial atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and all those efforts throughout that time to get to this point. So, but I think that's twofold and that it shows you how much work there is left to do, but also you can feel a sense of hope and how much work has been accomplished. And I mm. have faith that through the continuous efforts of many individuals around the world, that we will hopefully reach a point where we have been able to denuclearize. Mm. Cool. Randy? So the clip reminded me of you know, something we've talked about in the past. Um, and so this, this idea of a normative framework um, and how it's built on, like, it's built on something. And the question is, is it 
states? Is it individuals? Is it beliefs? Is it, you know, it's just like, what is that framework standing on? And uh, I, I think because we're doing an introductory show, it's useful to, to sort of build that frame very generally again. Um, you know, we're, we're thinking in the biggest frame possible. We're asking, okay, why is it okay to use a nuclear weapon? And it turns out you can't ever answer that question legitimately. So we need to find a way to remove this capacity from military, you know, for, from now forward. That has to be the case because, okay, well, they're just going to keep getting bigger and stronger, and that just makes the threat even bigger and bigger, even though it's already infinite. So what are we going to do, and who is going to be the one to do it? And so, you know, what we've done is we've outlined all of these courts and organizations that have their role to play in the big picture of disarmament and how that all feeds into a single treaty, which is on the table right now, or in 2017. And, and still, this question of norms comes back, and it's like, okay, but the thing that really has to change, which we've said a dozen times today, <laughs> is there has to be a revolution of thought. And people really need to let go of... The, I mean, really, it's talionic re- response, right? It's the, you know, eye for an eye. It's the, re- the reflex of fighting. All of, like, that at the heart of the issue needs to be what changes. The idea of retaliation, the idea of using force as a means to resolving disputes, that's really at the heart of it, and that's the piece that has to get changed. And all of these organizations and all of these courts and all of these things are small steps along the way through which our individual norms, our individual behaviors manifest themselves up on higher scales such that we don't think of swinging the second we don't get our way. Mm -hmm. And I, I really hope it moves towards that a little faster, but I don't know. I don't know what the appropriate pace would be. So, cool. Well, we've been going for over an hour, and um, uh, I will, you know, try to wind things down um, by following up on on that comment and closing, or at least trying to close <laughs> with uh, once again Bertha von Sutner. Um, <clears throat> So she, again, uh, wrote this book in 1889 called Lay Down Your Arms and became a leader of the peace through law movement, the objective of which was not to eliminate certain weapons, but to eliminate war as a means of settlement, uh, dispute settlement. Okay, so the whole movement is not focused on specific weapons, but the whole game itself. And she famously, you know, took issue with uh, people who were focused on specific weapons, and um, in particular, Henry Dunant, who was trying to, as she puts it, humanize war through the first Geneva Convention. Um, I have been uh, having translated in, for the first time in English her diary from the 1899 Hague Peace Conference, and she, she says something really interesting there. I'm going to quote it, and then we'll just go around and, and close out this conversation. She says, The preoccupation with the humanization of war is too often seen as the first task, or at least a useful side task, of the peace movement. And the dichotomy of the two efforts is overlooked. The peace movement, which created the current conference, aims at securing the peace 
and has nothing to do with the regulation of war. Imagine there had been a Congress to free slaves. Would there have been the need for another convention to discuss the treatment of Negroes or about the number of lashes they are to be given if they appear lazy during the work in a sugar plantation, or a movement against the laws of torture? Would the agreement to ensure that the oil to be dipped into the ears is only heated to 30 degrees instead of to boiling point, would that be a step on the way to the goal, or wouldn't it be more a holding on to a path they were trying to leave? And she goes on. And I just want to draw attention to that. The Habaksha message is one of abolition of war entirely. This was the original aim of the 1899 Hague Peace Conference. And Bertha is there reminding us that like, that's the sort of goal. Um, and maybe we get rid of one evil, nuclear weapons, um, but you know the the evil itself is is this way of solving disputes. So, um, and if if you have the presence of mind, she uh, and she want to like look up the German. It's June seventh, eighteen ninety nine, that she she writes those words in the in the German. <clears throat> um, so. I'm just going to go around, beginning with Taylor, uh, closing out. Um, uh, but actually, I think Taylor's having some technical difficulties, so I, I'll, I'll I move on. Do, I can do it. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to run away from noise. Um, yeah. Go ahead. So, it, uh, so I guess the thing I think that really resonates, especially on what you just said, Hope, is this idea of like this deeper evil and the fact that conflicts are occurring and the fact that um, humanity, principles of humanity and dignity are being um, dismissed all the time. And I think one of the reasons nuclear weapons really stands out is, is it you know, could be like the destruction of humanity. But if we keep acting in a way that puts nations first and, um, you know, really focuses on sort of power and this game theory of um, mutual assured destruction and deterrence, um, we risk, you know, losing humanity as a whole um, and really devolving into um, a really conflict-oriented world, which we kind of already are at. Um, but I think mm. the protections of international humanitarian law and different treaties really protect us from just, like, living in complete chaos. And mm. so I think that's why, to me, nuclear, the nuclear weapon, the focus on um, the abolition of the use Oh, well, not use the abolition of the, the like the abolition of the presence of nuclear weapons is so important um, because it's sort of a case study in how we get um, countries to stop, you know, stockpiling mm -hmm. weapons and whatnot. So that's my thought. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Yes, I would like to close with a quote from Setsuko Turlo's speech. <laughs> in Oslo, Norway, when she was with Beatrice Finn and ICANN as they accepted their Nobel Peace Prize. I have been truly, she's a Habaksha who survived the atomic bombing at age 13 in Hiroshima, and she had this to say at the conference when she was accepting the Nobel Peace Prize with ICANN. She says, when I was just a 13-year-old girl trapped in the smoldering rubble, I kept pushing, I kept moving toward the light, and I survived. Our light now is a banned treaty. To all in the hall and all listening around the world, I repeat those, those words I heard in the ruins of Hiroshima. Don't give up. Keep pushing. Keep moving. See the light. Crawl toward it. On the 7th of July this year, which was 2017, I was overwhelmed with joy when the great majority of the world's nations, 122 of them, voted to adopt the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Having witnessed humanity at its worst, I witnessed that day humanity at its best. And that truly instills with me a sense of hope, also a great drive to continue to work, that through perseverance, an immense amount of education, ensuring yourself with a great sense of fortitude, ex allowing yourself to be vulnerable and open to others, pain, sympathizing and empathizing with individuals from around the world, that through this process we will one day hopefully be able to live in a world free of the shadow of utter human annihilation at the hands of nuclear weapons. 
that is where I end my contribution to this amazing conversation. Thanks. Randy? Now, it's something we've talked about many times that um, the peace begins uh, in the small places close to home, uh, as Eleanor Roosevelt. And uh, one of the things that I want to stress as we close is we have to make these norms, these big, wide scale international norms part of our own lives. And the idea really has to boil down to using something approaching arbitration to solve our own disputes and use something approaching sympathetic empathy in order to, you know, deal with, deal with our neighbors and deal with our, you know, our fellow man. So uh, I really think that in one of the early shows, we talked about the seven rules of harmony and, you know, the final one is to do some small act of peace every day, which, which serves the greater cause. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. And it's really like, if, if we really want to make this come into the world, we have to make it uh, real in our own lives. Mm. So mm. how can we begin to smooth our own edges so that we're not quite so sharp when people come to us with the disputes. We don't immediately think of stabbing them um, or in this case, blowing them up. Like there, there has to be another way. And it, it always starts with the individual as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Thanks for that. Um, and I'll just end again with Bertha von Sutner and <laughs> just remind everyone that, uh, yes, I can uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. Ms. Thurlow um, and Ms. Finn give speeches in acceptance of the Nobel Peace Prize. And the Nobel Peace Prize can be directly directly traced to Bertha von Suttner, um, who was the first women, woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize and for whom Nobel created the prize. Uh, he was in love with her. He was leaving all of these prizes, Nobel Prize for Chemistry, Nobel Prize for this, Nobel Prize for that. And she said, do something for the peace movement. Uh, Give some money to that. Leave some money to that. And so that is where the Nobel Peace Prize comes from. And so all recipients have, you know, this, this debt to know the lineage that they are in. And again, that whole, like this, the first Nobel Peace Prize is 1901. And the first person to get the Nobel Peace Prize is Henry Dunant. I think he shares it with with, uh, someone else. But this goes back to this pre-World War I history, this effort that we have been working on way before Hiroshima nuclear weapons, and this optimism that, Michael, you expressed that you transmitted uh, Ms. Thurlow's optimism is absolutely expressed by the um, the peace activists working on behalf of the abolition of war, that is providing states with another process, that's all. Um, and then like remembering to use that process is like something that we have a difficult time doing. So that is why we're here. We all try to yeah, remember it for ourselves as individuals because that is extremely important uh, to echo what Randy said um, and hopefully to yeah, send out some of this information to you all. You have been listening to Virtues of Peace and hopefully we will be back next week. Have a great evening or morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Goodbye. <laughs>